Welcome back everyone. I'm Chelsea J and this is my channel Crime Light. If you're returning here, thank you so much for tuning in. If you are new, then welcome. The past few releases, we covered the Madeline Soto case as well as Sebastian Rogers. This week, I was ready script in hand to talk about the Ashley Benefield's upcoming trial, which is scheduled for July of 2024. And yet I had put a poll out on Instagram asking my followers, hey, what do you want to hear? Because everybody knows that I've been just very invested in both Madeline Soto's case and Sebastian Rogers. Regarding Madeline Soto, which was something I covered two weeks back. She turned up deceased, unfortunately, and I'd like to cover that momentarily. And then with Sebastian Rogers, this is all based in Tennessee as we speak. He is a 15 year old autistic missing individual. And boy, that is, I don't even wanna say a rabbit hole because I don't wanna disrespect the members of the family. So with all due respect to everyone involved, it's complex. The case is just not getting anywhere. And yet I have been just so moved to watch so many people on uh, different groups on the internet, uh, different news coming out and, you know, finally covering this case as, uh, you know, some of us have felt maybe it's been a little overshadowed by some other um, news broadcasts and yet everyone, everyone is important. And so we wanted to be sure those of us that are kind of sticking like glue to this case to ensure that Sebastian doesn't fade away to being another missing person. And I'm gonna talk about why this case is important. And I pretty much guarantee you that you're going to care about Sebastian as if he was your own family member once I complete my content here. So he is missing. But I'd like to begin with Madeline Soto because I completed content for this 13 year old child that ended up deceased in the woods unexpectedly for most while at least one person knew what had been happening to her. And that was what they call her stepfather, but what I think that we all consider now her perpetrator, her abuser, the worst kind of person, Stefan. We learned last time when I released content that he had been harming uh, S.A., this little girl, for at least two years, and she had just turned 13 a few days prior to her death. So we knew that she was getting hurt, okay? Like I shared some of the affidavit. What's come into light now is the fact that this was going on for years. What I found was since 2019, and it went from just getting hurt to, I mean, the absolute worst thing that you can imagine. And honestly, the best news coverage for this case is gonna be on court TV. They are covering it like daily. They're the ones that I resource from because they're the most accurate and, you know, they keep it very appropriate and yet they entice you with the story. We want answers and we wanna know, was it just one person that knew about this, which was Stefan Stearns or, was there a second person that might have known what was going on? And that would be sickeningly her own mother, Jennifer Soto. So first, let's cover the animal, Stefan, because oh my gosh, how things have really come into light. I've taken a clip here and I want to go over it real brief, but I, I do feel that we owe it to Madeline to talk a little bit about her suffering. Stefan Stearns has been taken into custody and he has since been charged with 60 different counts. Um, among them, uh, sexual abuse on a child under 12, sexual abuse on a child between 12 and 18, lewd and lascivious molestation, and then 40 counts of basically possessing uh, child porn with the act of, of a child. So uh, court dates were set this week. Uh, first of all, he was scheduled for an arraignment on April 2nd. I'm be using terms that you'll be familiar with from your time in the courtroom. Um, it was set for the morning of April 2nd, which is a Thursday. Uh, sometime today, this morning, this afternoon, that appearance was waived. Um, now, uh, when, when he was first arrested back on March the, uh, excuse me, February, the, the last week of February, um, he refused an initial court appearance. Uh, and then uh, for the reading of the charges, he did not appear in court either. He, uh, his his um, public defender appeared in his stead. So 
Stephen Stearns has yet to appear in court, and it appears that he's trying to avoid this at all costs to, to make an appearance. Um, now, uh, court dates have been set. He, he's, his trial has been set to start uh, for the week of the May 13th docket uh, with a pretrial hearing set for April 24th. Many times, defense attorneys will ask for a continuance. Uh, these may just be dates on a website since we still don't have murder charges in the case. And I think once murder charges are filed, um, I think all this is gonna go up in the air. This guy doesn't wanna be seen in public. What does that tell you uh, about Stephen Stearns? He doesn't, doesn't show up for his arraignment. Wait, I don't wanna be seen. Don't put me in. He knows in Florida there's cameras in every courtroom. But I think that we have to begin to envision that this offender, if he is guilty, is a lot like a lot of other people who engage in pedophilic acts, um, a, a rather interpersonally odd detached, fantasy-oriented kind of an individual. Um, but at the same time, what we see here are interesting elements of the groomer type of offender who tends to be a little bit more interpersonally adept and clever. Uh, the whole point of a groomer is that you use your relationship skills to lure the, the victim as opposed to a more odd person who just uh, snatches somebody in a car or something like that. Uh, but but I think that, that what you're getting is a sense of a person who's just not very adept interpersonally, which is probably why uh, he engages in in a, a relationship with a child. Uh, I wouldn't expect this person to be particularly good uh, at having adult normal relationships. You're talking about an offender who probably took advantage of the fact that this child was missing a certain kind of a figure in her life, which creates a vulnerability where you can come in and be a dad figure, spend time with the person, engage in uh, creating a kind of a confidence. Uh, and it's a way of sort of taking a kid who might be feeling kind of abandoned or dropped and suddenly making them feel special. And that is taken advantage of by this type of offender to groom a child uh, and in, then engage in increasingly perverse uh, contact. What I think is you probably had a child who, um, where the offenses were so normalized over time that she perhaps didn't realize that some of these things were outrageous or engaged in this kind of relationship thinking that it, that it, you know, that it, that it connected her to this outrageous person. And um, that's why it is very interesting to think about why the child would have to be eliminated at 13. It makes you wonder if it's that she was getting to an age where she was realizing that what was happening was wrong or would could talk about it or perhaps had aged out of the age range that this offender was attracted to. Uh, but it's but it's unclear uh, what that's about. But I think we have to understand the dynamics of abuse and that there's a mixture of fear and being confused that this person loves you. One of the things that comes up here is this idea that he is documenting all of this. There, there's one, Vin, there's one date that sticks out in my mind in this. And I think that there is uh, a date that goes back on, I think this affidavit that was filled, filed with some of this imagery that goes back to 2019. And you can do the arithmetic there and get an idea that she would have been about eight years old. And he has documented it all along. And I, I got to tell you that for the prosecution, this is a gold mine what they're talking about here, because you're talking about being able to have all of these benchmarks along the way, methodically documented within that household moving forward. And it's gonna be one whale of the case that the prosecution is gonna have on their hand. It's gonna be a mountain of evidence is what it's come down to. And my friend, we haven't even talked about, you know, what the medical examiner is gonna conclude at this point, because we don't know. And we're waiting to hear manner, cause, and any other details that may come out. Jen Soto, any word on where she is? I know she's kind of been out of sight for a while here. I tell you, she's playing the great role of prisoner of war. We have not heard from her. Uh, what I had heard last week was that uh, she, I heard second or third hand that, that she had lawyered up. You know, when we go back through social media, uh, you see references to Stephen uh, Stephen going back to about 2018. Forensic evidence that Kissimmee Police have put together is that the cases in the charges likely occurred starting in June of 2019. 
would that be quick in your mind going from you know getting into mom's life and then doing what he's alleged to have done to her daughter not at all in fact offenders that i've spoken to have told me that sometimes they choose to marry a woman because they have spied the child that the woman has uh, you remember for example that occurs in the nabokov book lolita uh, where he chooses to marry a woman because she has the underage daughter that he's attracted to grooms her and then winds up in a relationship with her and um th so the idea would be to become involved and then there's a period of some months to a year so forth etc depending upon the case where you groom the child break down boundaries uh you know and normalize things one very important elephant in the room here that i haven't heard anybody else talk about is that a person who engages in pedophilic behaviors like this does not start doing that in their 30s chances are what is eventually going to happen if you He's guilty of this is we're probably going to determine that this was not his first uh, experimentation with this. Usually these kinds of offenders have scores of victims. Sometimes they've even worked jobs that have put them in contact with children so they can experiment with touching children, finding ways to earn their confidence. For example, I had heard um, some idea that he potentially worked at Disney World. And this is very interesting because it would place a person easily in contact with children, particularly if you're wearing a costume. We all know the story of John Wayne Gacy dressing up as a clown so that children would touch him. Uh, so that this becomes a way of breaking down boundaries and gaining confidence of children. And I think when we look at that age, we have to be very, very concerned that there probably were priors. Take a look here at count 21. This is one of the worst counts, and there are multiple counts just like this. Like, it talks about bestiality, it talks about SA, but in the most violent way, it talks about the fact that it involves a minor, and sadly, the minor is Madeline. I, I just feel like anyone, like there are so many questions. How did this happen? How did people not know that this was going on since 2019? And I mean, gosh, the worst part is to think that maybe her mother knew and just was protecting the boyfriend. When I see him, I'm just, I'm sickened. I don't even have the words as a woman and as a mother to know that this little girl had been violated for years. So I'm gonna leave a couple of links to Court TV down below in my description. And I do highly suggest that you educate yourself further on the case because it's unwinding. And then here's a little snip from JLR Investigates, who has, you know, personally won me over. I have really been enjoying JLR Investigates' channel. He is entertaining. He is seeking the truth. He is honest, and he's very good at what he does. So the Kissimmee Police Department has gotten back to me. This is interesting because I was seeking records on Jen Soto. I was seeking certain things about Jen Soto and her attorney because she did lawyer up. My sources told me she did lawyer up. She stopped communicating with uh, police after the body of Madeline uh, Soto was found. She immediately, I don't know who assisted her, who assisted her with the lawyer, but it's off. it kind of almost happened a little bit after this GoFundMe went up and then went down. So, and, you know, some people are like, well, the GoFundMe money was probably used to, for her to at least retain a lawyer. But the Kissimmee Police Department has gotten back to me. Um, in reference to my public records request. And in this in this response, I'm going to read this response to all of you so we can have an understanding of what's going on. Good afternoon, the Kissimmee Police Department is unable to fulfill your request as the requested case or email for Jennifer Soto is not available for release since it is currently open and active within our agency. It is recommended that you check back later. And that's what i wanted to do that was the point of me asking for records that you know if i knew because under florida uh public records requests it's called the sunshine law if there's an active investigation in a case um or in a on a particular individual you are going to be exempt not not necessarily a case itself because i didn't ask for anything in reference to madeline soto you know but i asked specifically for stuff on jen soto and it got denied because it's an active and open case she's under investigation folks that's clear cut what's going on with this situation she is under investigation she's lawyered up there's rumors that jen soto um is in a mental facility or some sort of uh, place where she's seeking mental help 
help. His channel will also be in the link down below. So to recap Sebastian Rogers open investigation on February 26, 2024, 15 year old Sebastian Rogers disappeared from his Sumner County home, leading a large scale ground search that resulted in first responders covering about 2000 total miles in effort to find him. If you're not familiar with this case, I did a little beyond an hour of disclosing bits and pieces, but most importantly, the facts on what we had been told about the late evening of February 25th and or the early morning of February 26th when Sebastian vanished from his home. Now, lots of people have had questions because we can all agree, you know, kids, they don't just vanish. Something happened and as a nation, we're coming together and we wanna help. One thing that has been noticed and continues to agitate people is that Chris Proudfoot, who is, married to Sebastian's biological mother, Katie, he is known to be the stepfather, wasn't even present for the disappearance of Sebastian, allegedly. And he keeps talking in the interviews instead of Sebastian's mother, Katie, who was present the weekend that her son, Sebastian, went missing. Also, Chris keeps pushing off questions through the few interviews that he's done and telling people publicly in almost every interview to go to the TBI, which stands for Tennessee Bureau of Investigation, go to their website for more information. You know, I'm not gonna give you that. I don't think this is something that pertains to the case. I don't have to answer for that. Like he continues to constantly push away questions that might actually put people's mind at rest or even assist in the investigation of Sebastian. And to us, if he loves him at all, then we're not understanding why he continues to push off questions that could really benefit the public to help because that's what the you know that's what we're here to do on TBI's website that Sebastian's uh, let's put it this way Katie's husband because we have actually been asked to no longer address Chris as Sebastian's stepfather and we'll get into that more in a moment but Katie's husband Chris continues to direct us and it says. In order to preserve the integrity of the investigation, we cannot discuss many of the specifics surrounding the case, but we know how many people care about Sebastian and what has been done and is still being done to bring him home. Also, we want to caution the public about putting too much stock into information being presented in various media forms that is inaccurate or incomplete and could be damaging to the investigation. Notice that it says we, as in the authorities and the TBI, the investigators, but what about the parents? What can they talk about? What can't they talk about? And FYI, there is no gag order in this case. Chris is allowed to talk as long as he isn't providing information that hinders the investigation. And yet he's very resistant to things that we feel could help us learn more about both the family and the investigation. He tells us it's not our business or that he just simply cannot disclose certain things. It's frustrating and we're gonna get into it. Let's take it a step at a time and talk about this stuff really quick. Regarding an investigation and Chris being the spokesperson because that's really agitating a lot of people. Like, why is he talking? Why isn't Katie? So let's look into this. According to missingkids.org, family spokesperson, is this necessary? Depending on the media coverage and the scope of the missing person's investigation, the family of the missing person may want to consider selecting a family spokesperson to be the buffer for any media that is calling. The family spokesperson may also want to read a statement from the family on their behalf, run and monitor a social media page for the missing person, as well as schedule and vet all interview requests. It is important that the family spokesperson is giving out accurate and consistent information and they are in sync with law enforcement as to not jeopardize the investigation. Your relationship with the family spokesperson is as important as your relationship with the family. I already know you must be as frustrated as I am because there are so many things that you could argue when you read that, right? So we're gonna use this website a few times here today because there are some things that lean into Chris and Katie's favor and some information that says, you know, they can be doing more, but simply don't seem to be. For whatever reason, we do see the biological father of Sebastian, Seth, 
taking a leave of absence and being a sheriff deputy, he is cooperating in a way that just does not seem to be the same vibe or the same way that Katie and Chris are. As a nation, we have turned to the parents, Seth and Katie, alongside Katie's husband, Chris, for guidance and support in what we can do to help with Sebastian's search and awareness to keep this alive, despite no real evidence being found at this time. And so we expect the same from all the parties involved. And this does include Katie and Chris. Seth has done a lot of talking and he is currently, you know, taking a leave of absence, doing his own investigation. We know that Sebastian was actually scheduled to go live with his father, Seth, full time this upcoming summer in 2024. And Chris said in a recent interview, it's called Duchess, that's her channel name, that this was actually supported by all three parents. And that, I mean, he made that crystal clear, like this was not a problem. We all supported it. Whose ideal was it for Sebastian to move in with his bio dad after school was out? All three parents. Just remember that. Now that Sebastian is missing, Seth continues to hold out hope that Sebastian is alive and well, and he will return at any given moment and the two will reunite I'm sure with Sebastian going straight to live with Seth, who again is a sheriff deputy. However, it has been speculated that maybe Chris Proudfoot and Katie Proudfoot may know a bit more than we do. Chris seems to laugh these days or at times be very assertive toward the speculations of others. But it's actually the truth that Chris and Katie know more than we do because public records leak or people want to know more information. And, you know, Chris, at first, he says he usually can't talk about it because it's an ongoing investigation or it's not our business or that, you know, some questions, they don't have any affiliation with the investigation. Now, I, I will say this much. Let, let them ask questions. I mean, we're not hiding anything. I've heard so much negativity that I refuse to answer questions. Let them fly. So people want to come back with their own assumptions. And I'm so, so sorry that I can't open up and give you every little piece of evidence and every little detail that we know. I am terribly sorry. It sucks because when it does and it can't come out, my only question to everybody else is, when are you going to start issuing public apologies? That's, that's not to you. That is to everybody that wants to come out and badmouth people that don't understand and don't have a clue what's going on. And I think that's pretty fair. I would hope they would be respectful in their questions, but please let them fly. We're good with it. Someone wanted to ask, Angela said, I would like for Chris to clarify what he meant when he said he hasn't seen Sebastian since early February. Are you able to clarify? And if you're not, just state that. So I cannot give certain details with this investigation, and that's kind of one of those things. I wished I could eventually down the road. I'm sure that that will allow to come out. Early February was the last time that I saw Sebastian, and no, I was not home when all of this took place. I actually got back to Nashville, and I believe it was it was later in the afternoon. Do you all have camera footage in your home? I've heard people saying that too. Uh, that is that is some information that we cannot divulge at this time due to the on, ongoing investigation. I uh, wish we could, Sebastian, but unfortunately we can't. <laughs> did Sebastian ha have a key to the house? And if he did, did he take that key with him? That is another part of an investigation that's ongoing that we cannot answer. Um, they want to know that you definitely took a polygraph and passed because it got cut off by a different question and you, they feel like you did not answer that. So I'm just asking one more time. This is the last time guys, I'm going to revisit this question. Okay. For the record. Mo, he said he passed it according to Amy. Well, hold on. Somebody asked the question, was a polygraph taken and has it been passed? Yes. I didn't specify who or when, but what I can tell you, everything has been vetted completely. Polygraphs have come back as passed. So I'm confused as in why they're all wondering if myself, my wife, and the biological father took one. When law enforcement agency has come out and told everybody, even in the TBI news link, if you guys hadn't read that, Please go out and read that. That's got a lot of great information in it, especially it's probably the most up-to-date information. 
but they will even tell you at this point in time, there is no, they have no reason to speculate foul play, anything on the parents. Everybody's been extremely cooperative of anything and everything they've asked us. The father, the mother, and myself have been extremely cooperative. We have been vetted. We have been checked out. We have been questioned and everything of that nature and literally have been cleared. There is no wrongdoing. There is no negative input from the parents or any of the family. You know, um, and I, it's hard for a lot of folks. I mean, there's, I, I will be honest and say this out loud. I have a custody case that is currently going on in another state which has been brought to public light because people feel that they want to judge and think that they understand what's currently going on and they don't. Because of that, I am being looked at in a very foul, foul way. Why are they wanting camera footage from Sunday afternoon? Because that we can, that we cannot release right now. Okay, that is not I something understand. that has been authorize us to uh, right. put out to the public. Some posts that I saw, um, apparently it's because, Chris, you are, um, that he's scared of you, <laughs> that he's scared of you and he's, and that you're bullying him at home. And I just, I, I hate, I don't, I don't like to ask these questions, but I feel I like prefer, this needs I would to be actually, addressed I would actually prefer you ask because I, I just want you to, um, Talk to us about why people are saying this and why people are also putting online that you have domestic violence charges. No, no, that's, I'm okay to address every bit of this. Okay. So you mentioned Sebastian's afraid of me. Well, that is a loaded question because somebody who has released some information out there from another show who um, I won't put his name out there allowed somebody to say something you and you have a teenage child or teenage children all parents know this your children are not going to like you because you're not there to be their best friend you're there to be a parent and as parents you have rules they have to follow if they don't there's consequences sebastian will say one day he's upset and mad at me for something and 20 minutes later will run up to me, throw his arms around me, cry and say, I'm sorry, and I love you. You know, when, when you get in trouble, of course you don't like your parents. You know, he said the exact same things about his father. But that's when you set him down and say, look, bud, parents are parents. And we're going to have to do what we have to do. And unfortunately, you're not going to like it. But down the road, when you get older and if you decide to have children... Someday you're going to look back and say, man, they were right. People have their opinions. They have their thoughts and their assumptions, and that's fine. I have never once stopped a person from having them. That's why we are people. That's how we are. But knowing the facts are one thing. And then assumptions behind what you want to put out there is something totally different. Right. You know, you addressed domestic violence. There are some folks out there who have decided to go online and go pull some public records, which perfectly okay with domestic violence. If I had domestic violence in my background, I wouldn't have certain credentials that I have. People have asked about interrogations and polygraphs. All this stuff has been done. That was one of the questions that I had up next was, have you both taken a polygraph test? The results are past. You and said I'm sure, the results. I'm, <laughs> I'm sure they're the going to spin are, it. Yeah. The results of the polygraph was that you passed. Is that both of you passed or can you say? Uh, yes. Chris, is there any reason why you don't want Sebastian around your daughter? So uh, I'm going to make this real crystal clear for everybody. There's... Some things that can be just uh, can be spoke of, and there's some things that will not be spoke of. And personal issues inside my family are strictly that they have nothing, no bearing on this investigation. 
And that's quite honestly, I know this is going to sound snarky and rude, but it's really nobody's business as to that because it has no bearing on this case. All three parents have an agreement, and we all understand this. Tell me, did Sebastian take any type of medication before he went to bed or that would make him sleepy or did any, if he did take medication, it was just in the morning or did he take medication at night before he went to bed? He did take medication nightly okay. and daily. Um, okay. Okay. Just for HIPAA, for HIPAA reasons, we, are, we will not disclose. I understand. I uh, Yes, I'm currently working. Yeah, y'all. Now, no. where, where, understand people, where I work is really nobody's business. Um, and I would hope you would respect that because I'm not this criminal. I'm not this monster that everybody wants to believe. But I do believe in res privacy and respect, and it goes both ways. Yeah, I don't feel anybody should be going to anybody's job or anything like that. No, I don't. Now, verbally, let me furthermore give you another example of, uh, you know, this this kind of snarky, uh, snide behavior or attitude toward the public. Like, hey, dude, we're just here to help. But he's coming at us like we're, we're an enemy and we're just out to get him, right? So here's an example. Chris declares that he was out of town, all right? But he will not confirm where he was. At first... Chris wouldn't get into his court documents regarding DV and a child custody case that he has with his ex-wife in New Mexico. I have the audio right here to prove it. It was the first interview that he ever did on that channel, Duchess. Is there anything that you want to put to rest while you're here tonight or make clear to the public about this situation? And I, it's hard for a lot of folks. I mean, there's, I, I will be honest and say this out loud. I have a custody case that is currently going on in another state, which has been brought to public light because people feel that they want to judge and think that they understand what's currently going on, and they don't. Because of that, I am being looked at in a very foul, foul way. Um, I, okay. I don't need to repeat anything that's being said, but... Right, I you know, but and people it's that are, okay. there's people that's probably seen it on social media, and I want you to be able to have the opportunity to defend yourself. We have two. In my opinion, that came back to bite him straight in the ass because here's the kicker: April 21st in Albuquerque, New Mexico, allegedly the court hearing that he's supposed to appear regarding this case. It's public information regarding his DV and child custody case out in New Mexico. One of my favorite channels that I'm gonna feature down below because, oh, he's great. Like his name is JLR Investigates. He investigated this and he's still continuing to investigate it. And he's the one that came out and told us about this. And he said, this is something that anyone can attend on Zoom and JLR Investigates is actually attending himself. So it's not irrelevant. It's not irrelevant because we wanna know more about who Sebastian's immediate family was. And the more that this case begins to unfold itself, the more that I am furthermore curious as to why Chris and Katie are not doing everything in their power to bring this young man, Sebastian, home. Chris spoke out on the second Duchess interview and opened up so suddenly about this case, which I think it's because he probably knows that we're going to find out anyway and that we might end up learning for ourselves in attending this public Zoom court appearance what really happened. So that's what I think. I think he finally cracked and he finally addressed it. No, no, it's, I'm okay to address every bit of this. Domestic violence? No. I've had a temporary protective order and I had a no contact order placed against me in New Mexico with my ex-wife. Now, mind you, let me back up and I'll play the whole story for you. Me and my ex-wife, we actually lived here in Tennessee for a little bit. We had a daughter. And at the time, my daughter was only maybe six weeks old. An event took place while I was holding my daughter. And when that took place, I filed for an immediate protection order against her. We went to court. The court made their decisions. I gave my daughter back to her mother, and when she received her, she jumped in a truck and flew right back to New Mexico, 
got to New Mexico within two days of being there. She turned around and filed the exact same thing against me in New Mexico. Mm. So everything that people are reading, it's on a court document. But what you don't read is the um, all the things that are happening in the court. You're not reading the transcript. So, unfortunately, you don't know the full story. But right. if people want to ask, I'm okay to tell you. You know, um, yes, I still have a current custody case going on in New Mexico that actually has absolutely zero bearing on this case with Sebastian. Um, I do ask people to refrain from bringing that up because it has no bearing. Okay, thank you for that, Chris. Like, would have been easier the first time. I think this would have saved him some time and speculation if he had been open about this to begin. But as I stated, it's coming out anyway to the public. So it may look like cooperation so suddenly, but it might also be that he just doesn't have a choice because we can find out one way or another at this point. And here's the biggest thing of it all. Everybody has a past. Nobody cares about Chris as much as I think he thinks we do. We just want to clear our conscience. And I think it's a reasonable thing for people to worry about his involvement in the way that he's behaving right now, especially being the spokesperson for his marriage. I've even given Chris the benefit of the doubt by suggesting in my last content that I released that maybe his ex-wife is using Sebastian vanishing as sudden leverage to get what she wants in this, you know, court hearing. But I wanna show you something. While missingkids.org may be suggesting that Chris should stick to certain points, there's also what JLR investigates uh, kind of claimed to be word salad. Like he didn't make it up, but he did and does openly identify as Chris's communication level as word salad. It's a tactic that's actually called circular speaking. Circular speaking is when you reiterate a point multiple times within a conversation using a small variation of your language. It is making the same point again and again and again, no matter what anyone says, you bring up the same point and continue to discuss it. And we're gonna get into it again in a minute, but it, it that's all he does is just like go over the same stuff. Like at this point, we're just kind of looking for him to slip up and talk about Sebastian in past tense or maybe crack the way that we think or I think that he might have when it comes to his court documents. Uh, he can't seem to keep his story very straight. So we'll get into that in a moment. But the other thing is the efforts between Seth, Katie, and Chris do not appear to be the same across the board. Like the willingness from Seth to speak and to spend every waking moment to find his son. This is so painful. It doesn't align with Chris and Katie, even though Chris continues to say uh, over and over again that, you know, hey, we're, we're a great duo. We're not like your typical couple. Like these are podcasts. This is stuff that Chris has come out to say. We, we, we get along so well, but then we also view this response regarding why Chris and Katie have not attended one vigil and they have had multiple by now. Check this out. What's up with the vigils? We spoke, uh, we shared this yesterday about the vigils. There has been three vigils and Christopher Proudfoot found reasons not to attend all three vigils. He, cl he claims the first one, they were dealing with law enforcement agencies. The second, because of security reasons, I don't even know what that means. What do you mean security reasons? You're not going to attend a vigil because of security reasons? That don't make sense. And third, this one's interesting because I'm going to show you the family, the Rogers family speaks out about this and calls him out. Christopher Proudfoot claims the third one, we were not informed of it and it's in Clarksville where the biological father lives. That's what he's claiming, Chris, why he didn't attend the third vigil. However, guess what? Here it is. Sebastian Rogers' aunt. Christopher Proudfoot, that is a complete lie and you were notified the one in Clarksville and chose not to go. So don't try to make it look like Seth didn't tell you guys about it. So this, again, this is uh, family members calling them out on the Rogers side. I think they're fed up. I think they had enough. Not only that, folks, but... They, 
set up a GoFundMe and Proudfoots are trying to shut down that GoFundMe. And we talked about that yesterday, which I find is like odd that the Rodgers are out there looking. The Rodgers are out there putting more public awareness than the Proudfoots. What's going on there? Now, this is about an hour drive from where Chris and Katie live to go to Clarksville, which is also the future home of Sebastian because Sebastian was already enrolled in school out there to start living with his father in the summer and start school in the fall. Sebastian was supposed to come full time from summer on. I enrolled him in school and everything up here in Clarksville. So this was also in honor of Sebastian. Not only was a vigil held where Seth's home was, but I mean, Katie and Chris don't share children. I personally drive an hour and 15 minutes to take my daughter to an orthodontist appointment with my son who has autism in the car back and forth in one day. My son, uh, this is a hard car ride for him. So I want to know what does Chris and Katie mean when their crappy plain responses? Well, it was in Clarksville. Doesn't that kind of sound backhanded to Chris's original claim that they're all close? If a vigil is held in Clarksville where Sebastian was going to be living with his dad, I mean, you can't act like that was going to be off limits forever just because that's where Seth lived. I don't think anybody really understands, and that's because we don't have to, and we, we choose not to as well. It's unacceptable. They should have been at every vigil. Now, going back to what Chris says... Uh, you know, he was saying that they're so close. But Chris says a lot of things. I'll answer that. You don't have to. I, from his own, from what I read, and I did read this, um, he wrote it out. He said he did take one and he passed. He said that to someone. I think the person was Fifi or something. And he said, and I passed. And then he recanted on that later on down the road. And he changed this he changed the whole story all together all over again so he he can't the story's not consistent and if you if you are telling the truth your story never changes if you're not telling the truth your story's all over the board the story's everywhere well seth has come out and seth has said that he has not taken one because he doesn't need to He's not, a, I mean, everybody's a suspect until they're not, but the way that he's moving and trying to find his son, he volunteered, but I guess he was told that he really didn't need to, and probably because of the integrity. Uh, it, it was said it wasn't necessary. Have you had well, a just, When I walked, no, I haven't. I volunteered for a polygraph, and I was not given one. So now, when it comes to Chris, it's not just word salad. It's not just circular conversation. This is now just blatantly lying. Here's what Seth's mother, Sebastian's grandmother, has had to say about some of these facts. Pa be sure to pause it here and take a look at some of I commend any information we can get our hands on from Chris or Katie at this point, but according to JLR Investigates and from what I've seen on missingkids.org, the parents can and should be saying more. Seth, the biological father, does seem to be doing just that. Right now, he is out searching with blisters on his feet and it has taken him a while to come back around and do any interviews at all because he has been out searching. He admitted he doesn't get much sleep at all. He is exhausting himself. He goes to parks and he shines lights on the equipment. He calls out for his son on every street corner right now, day or night. So he hasn't really necessarily been tying himself up with small talk and in interview after interview, but he has shown a lot of cooperation off camera and on. Now, with Katie and Chris, one thing that is a little different to me is how they're choosing these 
smaller platforms to interview the same stuff, mostly what they feel comfortable to discuss. First thing is I know that I speak for a lot of people when I suggest that it would be nice to see that this national story about Sebastian Rogers start making some national headlines. Like I suggest putting this couple on Nancy Grace and I actually wrote this script and did all my studies earlier in the week. And then sure enough today, 3 2024, they came out with a Nancy Grace episode, but guess who was cooperating on it? If you were gonna say Chris and Katie, think again, it was Seth. Why have you been told that authorities are searching a landfill? They told me they just wanted to make sure that there was nothing there. Aaron Contrell joining me, News Channel 5 out of Nashville. Aaron, what can you tell me about this landfill search? Yeah, Nancy, so they had got a tip that potentially from the uh, the garbage workers that maybe the trash may have been off a little bit. What do you mean by that? You can't just throw a grenade into my mind palace and expect me not to follow up. What do you mean something was off? So basically the, the workers said they, you know, they have the same garbage truck drivers that come to the house. And when they picked up the, the garbage can, it just felt more heavier than normal. Um, so they just said that to the uh, authorities. So just to follow up on that tip, they went out to the landfill to search because that's where the trash is taken. Um, there in Sumner County, they take it out there to Kentucky. Um, so just following up on that tip, that's what kind of led them out there because, you know, we're used to our garbage, you know, the same garbage truck workers coming out there. They know kind of how the trash usually feels every single day. So it felt a little off for them. So that's why they told that to the uh, authorities. So that's kind of what led them to the landfill to start um, looking around. Seth Rogers, have you been asked to take a polygraph? No. Would you be willing to take a polygraph? I volunteered. But I think that they need to get Katie and Chris on Nancy Grace. Honestly, I got so much backlash from a few videos back about these two women that went to visit the Bahamas and they were saying SA. Listen, I'm not even gonna get into that video. That's a whole thing if you wanna check it out. It's about the Bahamas and the two women that lost all that weight. And anyway, it's a thing. But like they, went on Nancy Grace and interviewed. And anytime that they were coming out to interview, they would answer anything and everything, but with their attorney present. And even they put themselves on Nancy Grace. And Nancy Grace is a board certified specialist in family law. So I'll be honest, I've never heard of these smaller channels that Chris and Katie voluntarily go on. That's the first problem is that this is a big time national case. So why? go to some of these smaller channels. Why not take up some of these other people for some of their interview offers that, that could really get this story out? It, and they've purposefully avoided bigger channels. And this is not a sexist thing, so don't even think about coming for me on this, but I just wanted to say, females, uh, women, we nurture and go easy sometimes on people when it comes to loss, abandonment, when it comes to a mother losing her child, especially when it comes to th the topic of children missing or potentially harmed in the first place. Like it, it really agitates us. I've noticed all the hosts for Katie and Chris have been only female. Right. Said, it's not that I don't want to talk to men. I have talked to more law enforcement men agencies in the past 24 days and I've probably ever talked to my entire life. Same thing goes for women. So no, I don't have a problem talking to a man or talking to a woman. I appreciate everybody's assumptions or concerns, innuendos, whatever they want to be. But at the same time, I vet who I talk to. I'm not just going to open up and talk to anybody. Um, and I will put this out there. JLR, everybody wants me to talk to this guy. Explain to me, Smiley, you will probably have a better understanding of this. Explain to me why I should talk to JLR. Um, I just really wish you would because he does because he does go out everywhere and he he wants the truth. I mean, and he may not get the truth out of you, but I have seen him literally go in places deep like scary places and like really just try to get the truth and try to like follow people that's just taking him in the woods or whatever show him places whatever that he didn't know from adam he goes from one place to another he may be on a plane to mexico next time he might be in california whatever and 
you know, I mean, he's grown a lot. I just think a lot of people don't give him a chance. That's just my honest opinion. Right. Saying, Do you know why people don't want to give this man a chance? Well, go ahead and tell me. I mean, I want your opinion. So I'm going to tell you my personal opinion. Okay. Okay. This is my, my personal opinion. This is nobody else's, not my wife's, not anybody else's, my personal opinion. Okay. So I did my, I did my due diligence and I read up on Jonathan Lee Rich. Mm -hmm. Rich is, excuse me. I, I've read up on him. Not necessarily the best character in the world. When you start reading and the first thing comes up, uh, everything that you can find on this individual. Now, I don't know him, Adam, from Eve. I really don't. He don't know me, Adam, from Eve. But when he opens his mouth and goes out there and starts spreading lies, and he, yes, lies. Because unless you got hardcore evidence that I'm an abusive husband, abusive father, I've got a, a restraining order against me. Unless you got proof, don't open your mouth because it's real simple. I don't have any of that. Good luck finding it. I've never lied to y'all. I've been open and honest. People don't like my answers. So people want to come back with their own assumptions. And I'd like to see someone like either Nancy Grace get an interview going or, you know, let's let's go bigger. Let's go more national. Why are they avoiding these bigger channels? Like, why can't we um, get them on Nick Barris and JLR Investigates? And, and if not them, then like, why not Dr. Phil? Regarding JLR Investigates, whether people like him or not, I believe uh, thoroughly that he's a seeker of the truth. Nancy Grace would honestly do the same thing, and so would Nick Barris. So far, where we stand with the Proudfoot couple and allowing these people to help, take a look. But here we go, here's the conversation. Here's the conversation I sent to Chris Proudfoot. Here we go. So, uh, and look, he's active 10 minutes ago. So, we'll talk, let's talk, let's see what this is about. Hello, sir, I haven't seen one photograph or video of you out there searching for your stepson, Sebastian. Have you not searched for him? Let's search for him together. Guys, the viewers. Here's the conversation I sent to Chris. Guys, the viewers asked questions too. Uh, you know, a non-censored. I mean, long as they were respectful, not, you know. But here we go. Here's the conversation. Here's the conversation I sent to Chris Proud for. Here we go. So, uh, and look, he's active 10 minutes ago. So, we'll talk. Let's talk. Let's see what this is about. Hello, sir. I haven't seen one photograph or video of you out there searching for your stepson, Sebastian. Have you not searched for him? Let's search for him together. Are you down, JLR? And I sent this March 6th. So I sent this, uh, what was this, 12 days ago. I was actually out in New Mexico, in Texas, and was willing to go up to um, Tennessee to help and assist. So then finally this morning, I get a message, 5.08 a.m. Now, he was up late last night. Him and Katie were up late last night talking on a YouTube channel called Duchess. Uh, good morning. After reading your message, what does a picture or video of me or my wife searching for our son got to do with this investigation? With his investigation? I mean, what? What I have or have not done to search for my stepson is what business of yours? Well, I mean, he does have a point. To be quite honest, sir... You're asking me questions is absolutely hilarious. Why is it funny? Why me asking questions is funny? It should be the other way around. How are you going to make videos about me and my wife and say some of the things you have said and expect me to entertain this? Interesting. So I respond. Nine o'clock this morning. I got up a little late this morning, but I got up on Facebook and I'm like, oh, look, Christopher responded to me. Hello. Thank you for finally responding. Yes, I 100% believe you and your wife, Katie, are involved in what happened to Sebastian. So does thousands that follow. I also spoken with your neighbors, community members, and unnamed sources that provide me insight about you and Katie. I know a lot, Chris, more than you think, and gathering more intel as we speak. Giving you an opportunity to set the record straight. Come on my channel. Where I say, come on my channel to speak. Clear the air. I'll be respectful in questioning and hearing your side. 
Your lack of information and word salad to the public puts you in a negative light. This is not going away, Christopher. And then I responded again. Everyone just wants to find Sebastian. I'm sure you understand. And then what happened was I didn't get a response, but I saw his little, I saw that little uh, mark here in the corner. Like he read it. He read it. He read the, he read the messages and he didn't respond. So I respond again. Hello, sir. I see you're reading my comments. What's going on? How do you feel this morning? It's been three weeks now. Was told you and Katie were riding motorcycles around for a joy ride over the weekend. And that's what I was told. I'll tell you a little secret. Your own neighbors are watching you. Every move you make. They are documenting everything. Wouldn't surprise me if they have been tra- if they have tracking devices on your vehicles. If you are the lesser of evil in this, I strongly advise you to cooperate with authorities for the best deal. Do you know what happens to people who go to prison for hurting a child? The inmates are animals. Also, Seth is L.E. This is involving a child of L.E. Bad move, pal. Then he responds. Very interesting coming from a convicted felony. I would like to say thank you for all the attention you are putting towards our son's case. At least you are keeping it fresh. Well, I appreciate that. And I respond back to him. Yes, I am a convicted felon. I've served my time and now I live productively and successfully with a big platform. That's chat, Chris. My audience wants to find Sebastian. He responds, chatting with you so you can profit off our son's case is not something anyone should condone. Here is the real good question for you. Since you are speaking out on your channel about us, what evidence do you have that makes us guilty? If what you have or know is so strongly strong, please report it to law enforcement. I respond right here. Get it here. The platform you already spoke to on spoke on profited. Channel last night you spoke on, your wife was promoting their cash app. People were leaving super chats. I don't make much money on YouTube, Chris. That's not my primary source of income. What we can do, though, is you come on my channel to bring awareness to Sebastian and any money made from that interview, I will donate it all to charity like St. Jude's Hospital or a children's cause. This is not about making money. This is about finding truth on what happened to your stepson, Sebastian. He responds, you still haven't. You still haven't addressed what evidence you have against me and my wife to assume that we're guilty. What evidence do you have? And if you have any, why haven't you gone to law enforcement? I respond, I don't have any evidence because I'm not LE. I'm an investigative journalist spreading awareness and keeping my viewers informed. I was actually on the southern border covering the migrant crisis for the last two weeks, but I felt obligated to covering Sebastian's case because my audience cares about finding Sebastian. A lot of my viewers are from Tennessee. This has now turned into a national case. No response. And he saw this. This was hours ago. So maybe you'll respond. Maybe we're not. You know, we are speaking on the record. I would like to speak to Chris. Um, It's interesting. He's asking me what evidence I have about the case. I don't have any evidence. I told you I went out to the neighborhood and um, was out at the house. I did not go to the house and knock on the door. As I told you, I tried to arrange and had set up what I thought was going to be an interview with the stepfather and maybe the mother if she got better from a migraine she was suffering from. And again, whatever it was, it was all set. I was going to talk to them on, um, uh, I think, Tuesday um, and uh, never called me back the next day. Didn't return any texts. And it may be because he's tied up with other things or he decided he's talked enough. I can respect that. So I'm not going to invade their privacy. I did not go up and knock on the door. And yet Chris goes on to interview with these unknown channels. You know, hey, God bless you guys. Like, honestly, content creator to content creator, channel to channel. Like, I I mean no harm. I'm not trying to disrespect you. I swear. Thank you for all of your work and integrity through the case. But I'm sorry, man. Like, we need more national coverage. Now, I have reviewed all of the latest interviews that Chris and Katie have done. And honestly... 
it would be a waste of time if I did this, but um, it, I, it crossed my mind to back to back to back to back, uh, put all five interviews that they've done, two of which um, are Duchess Channel, and I, I like her. I think she she's a really nice person, and I, I understand uh, where she's coming from and trying to go easy. If you were to go to some of these other bigger YouTube channels, and I'm going to leave some links down below because you should see how they interview. Like, this would never fly. Chris is choosing, in my opinion, these smaller channels with these um, host women, and, and they're, you know, he's he's running the show. And, it, oh, I can't answer that. Like, pushing real hard, and they go, oh, okay, you know. And, and it's got to stop because we're not getting down to the bottom here. And I'm tired of wasting my time trying to figure this guy out because I, I think I already have an idea of what we're working with, and I, I'm pretty sure you do too. Now, listen, it is recommended through missingkids.org that Chris and Katie do watch what they say, and that's not really a secret when it comes to an open investigation. Let's take a look. Stick to the facts. Oftentimes there is little information available on the missing person, or there is more information available, but releasing the information could jeopardize the investigation. Be upfront. At this time, we are not at the liberty to give out more information, but be assured we need the public's help to find the missing person, in this case, Sebastian, and we are looking at every possible situation. You could say something without giving any investigative information. So I do think that's the intent with keeping things as close to the same story as possible. Like I get that he's intending for us to see it that way, but however, as stated, unfortunately for him, we're not dumb, okay? There is information that Chris can and should be talking about, not just for his benefit, but also to help us help them to help find Sebastian. So I've come up with a list of questions that have continued to get turned down and they are, where were you? Meaning Chris. Chris says that he's been cleared by the authorities. And in fact, he claims that he has passed a polygraph test. But Chris tells us when we ask this question that he is not available to answer that question where he was when Sebastian vanished, which it's like a no-brainer. We need to know these things. This is a part of something that can help us help you. And honestly, here's the kicker. Like this guy, he just really honestly thinks we're this dumb. If you're cleared, which he's come out and said, oh, we're all cleared. I don't know if I'm doing his uh, accent properly, but I, I did a polygraph. If you did those things, if you're clear, then why are you telling us that you cannot answer that question? Because wouldn't that mean that it is no longer part of the investigation? Or wait, are you still being investigated? It's weird because Katie told us where she was. Seth told us where he was. We knew until we didn't where Sebastian was, we would like to understand why this is not available for us to know. Because you say, Chris, that you're clear and I just need to know. What medications was Sebastian on? How did these medications help Sebastian? And now that he's been off of them for several weeks, what would we maybe see different in his behavior if we found Sebastian today? Why is this not okay to disclose to us? It's selfish to consider this not our business. If my son went missing, I would talk about anything and everything if it meant bringing him home. As long as it's not going to hinder the investigation, nothing would be off the table. And I would be very concerned about my son being off his medication with autism. So it's not off the table, not per HIPAA. The parents are allowed to disclose this and Chris just simply has chosen not to. And I feel like we've already addressed this, but I'm just gonna say it again, that when I listen to interviews um, regarding Chris and Katie, and this is in no way a reflection on the host, this is just, I believe, a manipulative tactic on Chris's behalf. Uh, sometimes when I tune in to watch this couple speak about what's going on, I feel like I'm in a therapy session talking about the memory of someone who was no longer with us. These people, interviewing ask the same questions, probably because Chris dictates the entire interview. You should check out all five that he's done. I'll leave the links down below. You know, how are you? And um, how you doing? And what's Sebastian like? And the important things that we really need to know to get the big picture is constantly said by Chris, I can't answer that. In a discussion group, people that actually work for HIPAA 
have actually come out to be like, uh, he can talk about the medication. So that's an example. Like, why won't you just tell us? I don't know if this is toward the host or not, but it's, it's something's going on here because I'm not getting anything more that I need out of the interview. So I'm, I'm just like, at this point, it's almost just entertainment or just watching to see if Chris is going to slip up uh, to, to even see another interview because I already feel like I know I'm going to see the same stuff. Why are the hosts uh, in doing the interviews with the mom Katie and Katie's husband Chris, why are they talking about or allowing Chris to dictate reflecting so much on Sebastian and what kind of a child he was when he was on medication and, you know, when he was in routine? Why, why do we continue talking about that stuff? Obviously, things have changed. A perspective that these hosts might consider is that now that he is out of his routine, uh, which in my opinion is causing him a great deal of trauma, and depending on the big secret of medication that he was on, how do you feel, Chris and Katie, that uh, Sebastian would act now? What was he like when he was off medication? What inspired you to put him on medication? What was the difference? Because somebody somewhere consented for this autistic child, teenager, to get medication for something. So what was it like when he was off? Because that'll really help us if we identify Sebastian. Katie also said that he was um, something about a mustache. Like he was upset that he was growing one. Okay, so he's been missing for several weeks. Does Sebastian grow facial hair? I didn't like get this covered at all. And we're looking for this baby face child. Could he have facial hair? Does his hair grow fast? I mean, how often are you cutting his hair? Like this is stuff that I think would be really good to know. Like my son personally has a lot of hair. He's a hairy kid. His hair grows super fast. I mean, he's seven, right? But I mean, if he was a teenager, I would probably be like, he might weigh this. He may look like that. And if you spot him, don't be surprised if this is the way he's acting. Because in these interviews with Katie and Chris, we're talking about, oh, we really liked parks and Oh, paper clips, and we used to take him to Lowe's and buy him little toys and play with him. Okay, well, good for you, that's great. I'm so happy, what a family. We need to know what we're looking for now. The game has changed, right? Like, we need to know what's going on with this kid that's missing. Like, get to the bottom of it. These hosts, they need to start asking some questions. It's hard to watch, it's like painful. What about birthmarks? See, I, I fear that Katie and Chris are avoiding the big dogs because they know that the big dogs, the bigger channels, are gonna go for the throat in the name of justice for Sebastian. And while some of these hosts may not know the difference between what can be answered and what shouldn't be answered, this is a bit of what the experience feels like oftentimes in trying to get some clarity from Chris. Are you able to clarify? So I cannot give certain details. You know, hey, maybe those are the facts. Like, you know, maybe he just really can't talk about it or maybe he can, he just enjoys control. Chris goes online and talks to the public and posts reels on Facebook, allegedly takes a break to go on a motorcycle ride. Uh, but hasn't attended a vigil. Katie and Chris went on a motorcycle ride. They took a they took a weekend cruise while Sebastian was missing and Seth has blisters on his feet and he's been out barely getting sleep trying to find his little boy, okay? That's the big picture of what's going on with these people. It's frustrating and when, when Chris goes online, it's like he's antagonizing everybody. It's almost to just piss people off. And that's what's scary, that he doesn't wanna answer questions he doesn't mind a good brawl online and he wants to take motorcycle rides. We're not getting anywhere with this couple, folks. Like, it's getting bad. So while the Proudfoots are really busy uh, taking offense to speculation from, you know, those of us that really care, uh, we have a heart for this child, Sebastian, especially because Sebastian is autistic. He needs medication. He was in his jammies. He took a flashlight, no shoes, no phone, no food no water. He was already uh, between 106 and 108 pounds. We don't know where he's at. We don't know what he weighs, what he looks like, how he's acting. We're not getting any information from the Proudfoot. So uh, this is hard because Sebastian, as independent as he was, he was still a minor and he, he did need a support system with his autism. So enough of those people. Let's talk about something far more important. Like, let's get to the bottom of this and that's gonna be only with Seth at this point in time, Seth and his mother, Robin. Through a series of time and days co to come, I will finish uh, the 11 hour interview podcast that she released. But my concern with something on a channel that's that long is that it's too hard for somebody to sit down and really care 
to put 11 hours in one sitting into information like this. And so I was able to get in most of the interview. I got in all the hours of the interview with Seth and I did stop to hear what his mother said. So yeah, I mean, I was able to get in the interview, which was about six hours. That was a lot of time um, in the last few days that it got released. The thing to note here is that this was about Seth and everything that he knows. And I was able to get a lot further with uh, one interview in a large sitting than I was five interviews in five different sittings with people that will not take the time to go out and search for this missing boy. So thing to note here is that Seth is a deputy sheriff who was raising his son to be as independent and responsible as possible. Seth knew when it came to his son that autism would not be an excuse or keep his son safe in the world. Seth, we've got Seth Rogers, this is Sebastian's father, and he's got a message. I need my son returned to me. I need my son to come home. I'm waiting. How old is he? Sebastian when you and his mom separated? She filed in 2016. Have you had a, have you had a conversation with his mother at, since this has happened? Have I had the conversation I want to have with her? No. Mm -hmm. no. Yeah, I was going to say probably not. So most of the correspondence has been through stepfather, maybe more so. Stepfather, both of them on the phone at the same time. There are some people that live off a routine such as i i live off a routine when i'm at work it's the same thing i do the same thing every day whether i work or not i work nights so even on my days off i sleep during the day my alarms still go off at the same time i get up i still make coffee you know when i had my son i would change i'd get i'd get home from work and I would come home, I would take a shower, I'd get a couple hours of sleep, and then I would drive back down to his mom's house to pick him up for the weekends that I would have him. And then I would literally come back home, and I would make sure I stayed up until it was bedtime for him. And then I would get him to go to sleep. I would go to sleep, sleep a couple hours, and then wake up because my natural body rhythm is already night shift. And I would just, I'd deal with it because I want to spend time with my son. I don't know what their routine was in the house. I know that when me and Katie were together and she would be on deployment, my routine at the house was better for Sebastian in school because it guaranteed that he would lay down and he would get a full, you know, a full night's rest. I don't really know their routine for how they do things. I mean, to me, a school night, bedtime's at eight. You know, I'm, I'm pretty adamant about that unless you're still working on homework or something. And the way that Sebastian went out, the biggest takeaway from this interview was that he did not feel that Sebastian would just vanish like this. Like he, of all people, the father, he knows this isn't normal because he has spent all, you know, pretty much 15 years of Sebastian's life raising him up to be safe, better be safe than sorry. And, and I feel that he earned a lot of trust with Sebastian. And I love, I love, love, love that Seth didn't utilize Sebastian's uh, disability to say, uh, you know, he had all these issues. He began the interview with saying, as long as it doesn't hinder the investigation, that he was willing to answer. And that just hit different because uh, we knew somehow that what Seth was going to tell us was going to be from the heart. When Chris says it, we're like, oh man, not again. We're going to get nowhere. But Seth gives us hope because he has hope. And I think that energy from Chris, I think that really leaks through his interviews and uh, everything somehow becomes about him for some reason and protecting him and his wife and defending themselves. But with Seth, we get down to the bottom of it. <sighs> Let's talk about some answers. First question, how are you? Well, he's not good, he's hurting. As mentioned, Seth did not take a polygraph. Okay, Chris said they did. Seth's like, I did not. I volunteered for one. 
I was not given one. Seth did recap his version of events right here in an audio clip. Calling a text message at about 6.20 in the morning. I'd been there since 6 p.m. Because I would like to beat traffic. Because on 24, you never know how traffic is. Mm -hmm. I was there about 6 o'clock Sunday evening at work. And then when I got the message at 7.20... Monday morning to call Chris that it was a 911. And when I called, that's when I found out my son was missing. I know that when I was, when I got to the house and I walked in, I saw the room was a mess. Uh, blanket wasn't, I mean, his room, his bed wasn't made, stuff like that. But they had already, police had already been in the house to search. Hey, they want to know what the F is up with the stepdad story. It's all over the place. I'll, I'll answer that, in my opinion. That way he doesn't have to. It's, it's fine because, I mean, I, I don't know. He's his own person. He's going to say whatever he wants to say. Is he one of your good friends? Talk to every once in a while. Text. Um, Call to see how much son. I don't know when Chris left for Memphis. From my understanding, he was there. He had been there. That's just my understanding is he was there. I know he was there the weekend before because when I had Sebastian, Sebastian's mom went to go see him. I don't believe he had been back, but they died. I don't ask another man what he's doing, really. Seth believes that if Sebastian got into a vehicle, he was either forced or he knew the person that he would get into the vehicle with or who would, you know, whoever would tell him get in the vehicle. Seth mentioned that Sebastian was between 106 and 108 pounds versus the 120 pounds that has been uh, displayed since Sebastian went missing. Sebastian has an iron deficiency. And from what I understood, he was supposed to be taking a supplement of some sort to help assist that. Because of the iron deficiency, Sebastian was prone to bruising easily. So, I mean, this is really good to know. On occasion when Seth was concerned about bruising, he would take pictures and he would ask Katie about it. But when asked, Seth said Sebastian did not know where the bruising had come from. At this time, police have Sebastian's phone, which was originally found left behind at the house when Sebastian vanished. Seth had taught his son to always have his phone, his wallet, and his house key. In the interview with Duchess, Chris states that Sebastian knew that the phone was to be used as a tool, but that he wasn't glued to it and nor did he act like he needed it. However, Seth mentions very clearly here that he did not encourage his son to go without his phone. And in fact, it's debunked by Seth's mother and Seth that Sebastian actually took a great deal of interest in his phone. The last time that Seth ever talked to his son was Thursday, February 22nd, which was said to be a short conversation about school and how his day was. Seth didn't call when Katie had Sebastian on the weekends because he wanted to respect their time together. Regarding the missing flashlight, Seth did not mention anything about the flashlight being a sensory thing. He was firm on teaching Sebastian about safety, to which Sebastian was aware where flashlights were in case of an emergency. And also it sounded like Sebastian would use his flashlight to hang out underneath his bed and to read. Sebastian was diagnosed at the Vanderbilt Hospital with autism in October of 2023 to Seth's knowledge. Now, in my last content, I went off an article that covered this story and that number that I listed in the last content just do away with because I was reading an article and it was obviously incorrect. So that's why it's really important to hear it from a source, you know, a trusted one, of course. Additionally, Sebastian was diagnosed with chromosomal deletion syndrome when he was about six months old at the Children's Hospital in Jacksonville, Florida. Now, again, this interview was like about four plus hours long. I'm just gonna lay it out because this was mentioned for a variety of reasons multiple times through the interview. They're not really fans of where I'm from out here in California. For Sebastian and Seth's own reasoning, it wasn't for them. Sebastian is in regular classes, but he is involved in a program called Why We Try. And the idea behind the program 
program of why we try at his school is to allow Sebastian room for mental uh, growth. What it's like is uh, when questions are asked in a set of 30, Sebastian will get questions as a set of 20. If children in the school are able to complete a task or asked to complete a task in like 45 minutes, Sebastian will get extra time such as an hour. Now everybody was curious, you know, did he have a tablet or a school computer that he carried with him? And the answer is no, he didn't. Since Sebastian's feet can continue to grow, he does not have a lot of pair of shoes. The few pair of shoes that Sebastian had or has are at Chris and Katie's residence. He has two pairs of sneakers and one pair of new boot barn boots. Seth was asked twice if Sebastian was trusting of adults and Seth replied twice that Sebastian would watch the body language of his father Seth. I mean these two had a lot of trust so from however Seth would react body language wise to somebody who was approaching him, speaking with him, that he was associating with or in the presence of, that's how Sebastian would determine if that individual was trustworthy. If you go and you listen to Chris and Katie, well, mostly Chris as we know, talk about Sebastian, if he liked people or had friends, Chris, as far as liking someone, kind of insinuated that it depended on Sebastian's mood or, you know, uh, it depends on the day, if Sebastian liked someone or he didn't. This can also be found on the Duchess channel. The second interview with this channel, uh, it's about three hours long, but it's on there. You know, the thing is, Seth does not talk about Sebastian uh, from an autistic standpoint, as much as he does about how, you know, this is how my son operates. He had money tucked away that nobody knew about, but they did find it in his room a week later. He had hid it in, in a, an ATM that he had built, <laughs> knew about, but they did Christmas cards he would get. Just for money, I mean, birthday cards, uh, Christmas cards, he would get, he would get money uh, here. I made him just put it in his wallet. So he was, he, he was already on that road and he was already starting to say this. He was learning already past his time. His dad had him on a road there. So he's still on that road. He's still on the path of learning. Savings. Okay savings. Every time that Seth talks about Sebastian, he doesn't ignore the disability, but he doesn't give the disability power the way that Chris and Katie do. Also, if you guys remember, or if you've heard it, if you don't, here's the story. Chris and Katie said that Seth, Chris, and Katie were all in total agreement of Sebastian living with Seth in the summer of 2024. Well, Seth actually told us in his interview that it actually took convincing Katie to do that. That, you know, there's something that they have in legal writing that said as long as all three parties agreed on it, on the moving thing, then that was legally okay to do. Seth took a lot of pride in raising his son. He was teaching him how to cook and considered watching Sebastian grow to be an absolute honor. A few things to note about the positives of Sebastian, which is again, a breath of fresh air because when you hear Katie and Chris talk about Sebastian, they're like, oh, here's his flaws, here's his issues, here's his disability. Every now and again, they'll say something cute, but they usually wedge themselves into it. Like, oh, we enjoy doing this with him or he liked when we did this with him or they talk about the problems that he had. In Katie's recent interview, she starts off by saying, here's a picture of my son. Oh, but he has chocolate milk. Just negative people. Uh, you don't get this from Seth at all. Seth said Sebastian had a fishing license and he was being taught responsibility. Seth said that when Sebastian was home with Seth on the weekends, that Seth had the weekends so full of things to do together that Sebastian was like almost in his own little world with his father. And so Seth confirms that because of that experience, just happy, 
living in the moment, learning with his dad, spending that quality time that Sebastian did not frequently like to bring up Katie or Chris. And it wasn't because he was hiding anything. It just kind of sounds like that's how Sebastian was. That he was really living his life in the moment with Seth. Seth was asked how long Chris and Katie had been together. And Seth replied, they've been together since before me and Katie were divorced. For whatever reason, Seth was asked if Katie was on any type of medication. I guess that could be relevant event seeing as to how her son suddenly vanished like maybe she was tweaking or something and Seth said you know that I don't know I just don't know okay so this part a GoFundMe was set up for Seth and a threat was made to Seth's sister about that from my understanding Chris did not want the GoFundMe up <laughs> because he thought it would interfere with the investigation. What's new, man? Like everything else, right? And it doesn't, FYI. And it helps with the search because it supports Seth to be off work and try to find Sebastian. So the GoFundMe that was threatening the investigation literally says, right here. Hello, my name is Sarah Swank, or Swank. I am the aunt of Sebastian Wayne Drake Rogers and the sister of Seth Rogers. As many of you know, my nephew Sebastian has been missing since the early hours of the morning on Monday, February 26th. Since Monday morning, my brother has been out of work as he continues this heartbreaking journey to find his son. I would like to reach out to see if we can pull together to help him a little financially. Unfortunately, the bills do not go away in situations like this. Any little bit would help take the stress off of him. I would like to thank you in advance for your donations and your prayers and continue search and fight to bring Sebastian home safely. Shut it down. It's interfering with the investigation. It's absurd. You know what's really sad? Chris and Katie ended up saying that Sebastian said he wanted friends for Christmas. Seth said when he asked Sebastian what he wanted for Christmas that Sebastian said that he wanted to go to Texas to meet up with his grandparents and hang out. And Seth said he couldn't do it because he couldn't financially afford it. He didn't have vacation time he needed to work and that his vehicle was having some, some trouble. And um, wow, like wow to think about the fact that Chris would try to shut this down with this man that might be driving a truck with vehicle problems if he hasn't gotten it fixed or he didn't have vacation time. So like he's off work and that was in Christmas and it's only March. So he doesn't have a lot of money, I don't think. And so like seriously, all jokes aside, could you please consider donating like even a couple dollars to him, please? Because it's hard. It's hard to talk about this case. Like as much as content creators make it a light topic, we, we try to keep your attention. We do everything we can think of to say the right things and to say it in the appropriate fashion to get you to continue watching our content so we can get a message across. If there's one thing that I could honestly ask my audience, because I have 12,000 followers, could you please donate? Because if, if 12,000 people donated just $5 to this man, we could help him stay looking for his son, seeing as to how Katie and Chris are not assisting. With your views, I'm gonna be donating a percentage uh, to his GoFundMe. So if you could do the same, it would mean a lot to me personally. But more than that, it would mean a lot to Seth and his sister. And I really think it's what Sebastian would want. So speaking of control and Chris, like that flopped quick, right? Here's what Seth thought about the 911 call that Chris placed with his wife, Katie, and a sheriff on the line because I don't know if you know this or if you know how much you do know, Chris three-way called a sheriff the morning that he found out Sebastian was missing. And yeah, he somehow knew to skip the cops and go straight to the sheriff like he's Mr. Smart Guy. So here's what a sheriff deputy Seth actually said about that. I think a three-way phone call to 911 is strange. Very, I do find that odd. Seth confirmed that Chris and Katie are not out looking for Sebastian. And also Chris keeps coming out and saying that they're clear, but Seth also confirmed that nobody is ever clear until an investigation is completed. And that's also according to TBI. Now there was an alleged vehicle spotted in the area the night that Sebastian went missing. This was kind of the latest thing. Um, from my understanding that 
they actually did track down the Uber and talk to both of the people that got in the vehicle and the Uber driver. And that was the guy that did that. And finally, to clear up the rumor about the flashlights in the backyard, um, I felt like we were getting really close to cracking the case. The last content that I did, I prayed and hoped for it so much, but unfortunately that didn't happen. So regarding that, allegedly that is no longer a thing in the case. I'm kind of not on the up and up on that, but I, I do know that that was uh, said to be cleared as well, which is very sad because then that just kind of put us back down to having not a whole lot to work with. But let's listen in closing to what Sebastian's grandma, Seth's mother had to say. And is there things like when he was with you all, did he like electronics? Oh, he, he's always loved electronics. He's always loved games. Um, and I would play games with him. He, he loved trying to beat me. <laughs> <laughs> we had a lot of fun. Um, so he likes games. But, but he would be in the kitchen with me. You know, he, he loved to help, help me cook and he loved helping me set the table and, and doing that sort of thing. Um, So he's a happy-go-lucky little rambunctious boy. A normal kid. <laughs> when he's with his dad, I can say that, that he is. He's happy. I mean, he's like any other kid. Yeah. He gets moody. He gets moody. He gets tired. He gets even more moody. You know? And he's not, you know, jolly jolly 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. He's a kid. Right. For the most part, when, I, when he was around us, um... He's, he was a happy kid. He's a happy kid. Did he ever seem like he worried about anything? Yeah. Being at his mother's house. Would he talk about it? So uh, she's not a fan of Chris or Katie. And you know, hey, I, I get it because you would think that we were talking about two different kids, the way that Seth talks about Sebastian and then the Sebastian that we've learned and have come to know about through Chris's words. And and, and Katie just sits there and she allows it. Um, you know, they talk about him like he's got these like problems with aggression and he's no friends and a phone's a tool so he knows better to, than to use it. We also get lectured. <laughs> Uh, openly, like, I can't believe the host let this happen. We just sit there and listen to Chris telling us that, um, you know, hey, we're, we're not our kids' friends, you know? Like, that it's normal for our kids to hate us, resent us, and avoid us. Like, that's, that's Chris's, uh, you know, frame of mind. That's what he thinks is normal. But, you know, when you talk with Seth or uh, Sebastian's grandmother, it's just so totally different. Like, you get this, like, happy, very amazing person, Sebastian. And, and and the difference is when you when you hear it from Chris and Katie, you feel like uh, there's another kid lost in the world with disability, okay? But when you hear it from Seth and you hear it from his mother, the world is at a loss currently because someone amazing needs to be found. Like something is missing from this world and, and we need to help this man and, and his mother and, and just all the people that love him and his mother meaning Seth his mother, not Katie. But yeah, my opinion about Katie and Chris have changed. What do you guys think? So thank you guys so much for tuning in. GoFundMe link is down below. Be blessed. I will see you next week for another case. I'm Chelsea J. Crime Light Out.